Okay, Greg, go. Okay. Uh, again, welcome. And uh, I'm Greg Thompson, uh, your Astronomy Merit Badge Counselor. We're here on our online uh, Zoom meeting in the virtual world. Uh, normally, I teach this badge on behalf of the Los Angeles Astronomical Society at Garvey Ranch Observatory, where we have the fun of looking through telescopes and going up in the dome and looking at the workshop where we make telescopes and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, because of COVID, we can't do that. Uh, however, I do have all of your email addresses. Once the astronomy uh, dome, the observatory is reopened, I will be sending you all an invitation for a scout night. And uh, you can come over and look through the telescopes and say hi. Uh, I'll have some gifts for you. And uh, I hope to share some of that fun I was telling you about. We're going to do our best. We have a really pretty exciting agenda tonight. The, uh, the lecture part is not so exciting, but you know that's how you earn the badge uh, with the workbook. So we're going to do some live demos. And tonight we have some amazing objects in the night sky. We have a, uh, a live telescope viewing through a, uh, a telescope shared in our Zoom meeting. So we're going to be doing live, real observing astronomy tonight, which is pretty cool. And uh, so again, welcome. Uh, by way of introduction, most of you need to stay on mute so that I can, I can talk and do my demos and, and share what we're doing. Um, if you have a question, that's just fine. You can either raise your hand and, or, or you can just uh, ch type in the chat and Carolyn will uh, read the question out for everybody and we'll get you an answer that way. So with uh, no further uh, ado, let's see, stay on mute, type your questions or comments. We will be taking a couple of breaks, one break uh, which will probably be uh, between 8.30 and 9. That will be our long break, um, probably about 15, 20 minutes. And during that break, you're going to take your star map outside to, you know, as best of a dark area as you have in front or behind your house. And you're going to try and identify some stars uh, and maybe some planets if they're up. And then when you rejoin, you'll be typing in what you, what you were able to see. We will be teaching you how to do that. So hopefully you'll have some success. I give a... Uh, uh, points for people that observe things. So try and get a few stars if you can. Uh, all right, and I think Carolyn, everyone's got their login name. Our roster is checked off. So attending the lecture throughout is one of the requirements. Uh, and what I'll talk about now before I start the uh, requirements presentation is how to earn the badge, because that's why you're here, right? I want you to earn the badge and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do that tonight. Everything you need to complete the badge should be in the presentation tonight. Uh, so, of course, I require that you read the Astronomy Merit Badge booklet. Um, uh, oh, I like Keith Law's background. That's super cool, Keith. I remember that day when we first walked on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you need to read the Astronomy Merit Badge booklet. You can get a physical booklet or you can download it in PDF. There's a link in the uh, logistics document I sent you. Uh, the good thing about the Merit Badge book, if there is one of the requirements that you didn't quite get enough information to fill out in your worksheet, or you wanna see a picture of, you know, on how that worked out, uh, all that stuff's in the Merit Badge book. So I'll ask you to uh, refer to your Merit Badge book. Uh, then you attend the class. So how you actually earn the badge is tonight, hopefully you are prepared the way my email said, you're gonna take notes or fill out your worksheet or whatever you need to do. Uh, that worksheet is your ticket to earning the badge. So once it's all filled out, you email me a copy, um, you can scan it and email it to me. Uh, if that's not possible, I will accept uh, you physically mailing it to me. Um, please email me and I'll send you the address uh, to send it to. Uh, uh, the drawings you make, you can make them right in the worksheet. Um, if you are gonna use a fillable PDF for the worksheet, feel free to just draw your pictures on a piece of paper and take pictures of those with a phone and combine all those pictures into an email to me. Once I get your completed worksheet, I'll review it. I will fill out a blue card for you. I'll sign the blue card. Then I will scan the blue card and I will send you back a scan of your completed blue card that you can print out and get your Scoutmaster to sign and turn in for your badge. If you would like to receive a physical, the actual blue card, which I will keep, send me an email with the address you would like it to send me to send it to. And finally, if you're Troop uses scoutbook.com and you would like the credit for your merit badge entered into scoutbook.com, please enter the information uh, uh, in an email to me or Carolyn and we'll send you the information. I'll log into scoutbook.com and give you credit there. So there's 
Uh, all three of those methods involve you emailing the completed workbook uh, that we will cover everything on tonight. Uh, and once I receive that, then I will take the action of generating your blue card for you. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, you can type them in the chat. Uh, I think uh, a few people uh, asked some questions uh, about, uh, it's okay to use a drawing program, as long as you can save out a file from that program and send it to me, I'm fine. If you're not a pencil and paper person, uh, as long as you created the image uh, of your drawings, that's fine. There are those prerequisites. There's four moon drawings and a couple of Big Dipper drawings that you have to do. The moon is not up in the evening right now. So if you wanna complete your moon drawings right away, if you haven't already done that, uh, you'll have to get up early in the morning. Um, however, at this point in time, there are two things in the night sky that are quite amazing. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are in the evening sky to the uh, east. Um, and the comet is in the sky to the west. I would accept drawings of those if you go out and do your own observing. Um, I know the requirement says moon drawings to so show the moon moving each night, but uh, if, uh, if you can't do that, you can take a few extra days to complete your worksheet. I highly encourage you to finish your worksheet in the next couple of days. What I found is just about everybody that earns the badge gets their worksheet done and to me in a day or two after the class. Once a week or two goes by, I don't see much more stuff. So I really want you to earn the badge and I will send you more information and links. We will post tonight's class on YouTube and I will send you a link to that so you can watch it again if you needed to brush up on an answer you missed or something. And we've been trying, I'll try and get the presentation uh, up on Google Docs and send you that. Or if you want me to send you a copy of the slides directly, um, it's kind of a big file, but I could probably email it to you if, if you needed to. So uh, that's it for all the introductory stuff. Um, I'm gonna demo our sky map first, and then we're gonna start in on the PowerPoint. So the first thing I'm gonna do, in the email I sent to you, I sent you a sky map. And I'm going to share that with you now and keep talking. All right. Hope everyone can see that. If you uh, didn't print it out, um, there's a smaller one in your merit badge booklet that you could use, although it's not as specific as this one. Okay, we got someone on. Uh, someone needs to be on mute there. Uh, okay. So uh, as the Earth goes around the sun. You can think that what we see in the night sky is what's on the dark side of the moon facing away from the sun. So if you do a little astronomy in your head, you realize that at different times of the year, we're looking at completely different uh, parts of the night sky. And for that reason, you see different constellations and planets throughout the year. So this is a monthly sky map. This is for July of 2020. You'll see it says right on there, Northern Hemisphere, July 2020. And what that means is this is the star map of what you would see in the night sky in the early evening in this month. So this is like a map, right? Like we do in scouting, whether it's a topographical map or a driving map or a GPS app or a whatever, it's just a map, right? And it maps out the constellations in the night sky. So I'm gonna point out a few details on this that are gonna help you find stuff. And uh, then we're gonna be talking about the sky map a little bit more as you have to identify some constellations and stars in the night sky. So the first thing I'll draw your attention to is uh, that blue line right through the middle of the map. And this is, uh, you can't really see it in the city because light pollution erases it, but this is the Milky Way galaxy. If you've been camping out in the desert or out at Cherry Valley or someplace with dark skies, uh, you probably have seen the Milky Way, and it's a whitish path through the night sky. Uh, in uh, ancient times, they didn't know what it was, uh, so they just called it the Milky Way, and that's what we still call it. But that is, in fact, our galaxy, which is shaped like a pancake. Uh, it's a barred spiral nebula with a uh, supermassive black hole in the center. And since we live inside the pancake off, uh, offset from the center about 50% of the way to the edge, when we look out at the night sky and look through the edge of the pancake, we see millions and millions of stars. And, but they're so tiny that you can't make them out separately with your eye unless you have a big telescope. So that blue path through the sky is actually, you're looking at our galaxy. 
down there in the uh, towards the south or the bottom part of the diagram, you'll see a little teapot uh, uh, constellation called Sagittarius. That is uh, where the center is. So that's in towards the center, and that's what that little bump there is in the map. There's a central hub uh, or bulge at the center of our Milky Way galaxy uh, surrounding the black hole, and uh, that is in the direction of Sagittarius. So tonight, if you look off to the south, uh, you'll be able to see the constellation Sagittarius. Think, okay, that's in towards uh, the, the center of the Milky Way. Uh, and the dotted line that runs through the Milky Way there, we call that the ecliptic. And what that is, is that's uh, our solar system. Our solar system is tilted with respect to the Milky Way galaxy and the planets and the stars that wheel around in our uh, solar system, uh, they all follow a line through the sky, right? So if you see Mars and Saturn and Jupiter and the moon and the sun in the next 24 hours, they all appear in a line across the sky. And that dotted line on the star map is the, the line. So as, as the sky rotates around at night, those objects, Jupiter and Saturn and Mars, will move around. Uh, with the rest of the planets. However, in addition to wheeling around, the planets also move along the dotted line in their own orbits. So uh, planets that are really far away, like Saturn and Jupiter, don't move very fast. It takes uh, many years for uh, Jupiter to make it all the way, or Saturn to make it all the way around the sun. So it'll take uh, uh, many years for you to see the planets move a lot. Planets that are closer in, like Venus and Mars, move much more quickly and you can see their apparent motion uh, relative to the fixed stars from night to night. Well, James, Joseph had a question. Mm -hmm. He was asking, are we doing 4B right now? No, I'm just introducing to you. We'll cover 4B in the slide presentation. So uh, this is some background information, but when we get to 4B, I'll put up a slide specifically on 4B. Uh, so I just want to familiarize with you with this star map because I'm hoping you printed it out. Uh, some of the stars and constellations that I'm hoping you have a chance to see tonight uh, are on this map. So get that map with you and uh, uh, take it outside during our break after sundown tonight. So that's the star map I sent you. Uh, there are other ones online. There's interactive ones, which obviously are super cool. Um, I can share that with you real quick. Uh, let's see here. Go back here. Stop share. And uh, let me show you an interactive one that I like. Launch meeting, summer astronomy. Uh, it this way, and it's gonna be in my browser. This is a browser-based one. The link to this sky map is in your uh, packet. And this is just an online star map. Oop, let's switch. What's neat about this one is you can zoom in, and you can see this is for Los Angeles, California at 642. But what I can do is I can go in here and advance the time. And what will happen is the rotation will change, right? And it'll show you now what's visible an hour later because uh, as I told you before, the sky rotates around. So oh, I wish we would quit changing like that. Uh, so this is an interactive sky chart online. I often use this app before I go uh, out observing and plan out what I'm going to do. Uh, so uh, down here at the bottom is a Scorpius, or there's Sagittarius, and we're going to be looking right in this area. You'll notice that there's a whole bunch of little blue markers right down here in the south. This is all these clusters of nebula around the center of the Milky Way galaxy in the direction of Sagittarius. Um, so the most important thing probably to understand about the night sky is it rotates around at night. And if you probably think about it, you're like, okay, well, the earth is a spinning ball. It goes around in 24 hours. So as you look out at night, the sky spins around like a platter or a, a, a record is what I would have said. I don't know if anyone knows rumors records, uh, but it rotates around, right? It goes around in a circle in the night sky. If you sat there for 24 hours staring at the sky and you could see during the day, it would make one complete circle as the Earth rotates around. Okay, so there's one star that doesn't rotate, and it's the one at the center of that spin. 
uh, like the middle of the pancake or the center of the record. And that is Polaris, the pole star. It's the center of the rotation. So that's why it's such an important star. You can use Polaris to navigate in the direction of north. If you extend the north pole of the earth straight up into the sky, it'll point directly at the star Polaris. Yes. Uh, Byron has a question. Go. Quick. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Okay. All right, so the way you find the North Star is up here in- uh, Oh, if this microphone is broken. Well, okay. Uh, all right, so uh, here's the North Star right here in the center part of the map up here. And you'll see that in Ursa Major, the two outer stars at the cup of the Big Dipper point right at Polaris. So where my mouse is right now, everything in the night sky rotates around that, the pole star or Polaris. Obviously, when we get to the requirements, we're going to list Polaris as one of our stars. And Ursa Minor and Ursa Major is two major constellations uh, because you, they're almost always visible. Uh, Ursa Major is also called the Big Dipper. And Ursa Minor is also called the Little Dipper. You can call them either way for my purposes. So that's enough about star wheels and star maps to find your way around. And now I'm going to go to our presentation, which should be here. And I want to present online custom slides to rehearse time and start from beginning. That's what I want. And it didn't do anything. There we go. Come on. It's uh, getting ready to start the slideshow. Yeah, we're going to start right in with uh, 1A and work our way through them. We'll probably take a short break uh, after about number five. We'll do our demo, finish up six and seven, uh, and then go to our live viewing, our uh, career panel after we uh, take our 15 minute break a little bit later. Why is this not working? Let's try it this way. Share screen, screen, PowerPoint. Yeah, something's wrong. Oh, there we go. All right, can you see it, Carolyn? Yeah. All right, so this is the first slide. Uh, so we're starting in on uh, number one. I'm not gonna dwell a, a, a long time on number one. We will go through the answer. So this is the online Zoom class hosted by the Astronomical Society. I'm Greg Thompson. You're gonna read the Merit Badge book. You're gonna complete all the requirements in the workbook. Checkout is gonna be emailing me your workbook. And if you get a partial, nothing's gonna happen. Uh, so try not to get a partial because uh, when you get the completed blue card, you'll earn the badge. All right. So, uh, Number one is the hazards. You know, all, um, a lot of merit badges start with how can you be injured, but um, let's face it, uh, astronomy is not a high risk pursuit. You're fairly unlikely to be uh, injured uh, while doing astronomy. But because it's an outdoor and at night uh, activity, there are some risks, so we will go over them real quick. Um, explain to your counselor some of the hazards. Um, so obviously you're, you're outdoors and you're in darkness, so it could be cold or maybe be kind of hot during the day, or there could be a storm or wind. Uh, so I guess being outdoors presents certain hazards, uh, especially if you are going to be working at night. Um, so, uh, you're supposed to say what you, what you should do. So. A lot of these requirements are in your basic uh, second class and first class requirements, but uh, obviously wear proper clothing and layers uh, if it's cool out to prevent uh, frostbite or getting really cold. Uh, the standard treatment for heat uh, is gonna be get someone in the shade and get them some water and monitor them in case they need uh, emergency medical attention. Uh, obviously, with weather, you're probably not going to be too concerned about astronomy. If there's a storm and it's rainy, uh, you want to get out from under that. Uh, but do watch uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the more common injuries uh, while doing astronomy are what I call stumbling around injuries. 
which means you're in darkness uh, and you can trip over things and run into things or knock over a telescope or, uh, you know, so you get like people trip and fall and they might hurt their hand or, or, or bang their knee. So these are just stumbling around injuries. Standard first aid treatments here, uh, you know, are gonna be uh, treat the cut or uh, you cover the bruise or whatever it is. Standard first aid techniques for stumbling around injuries. The how to prevent uh, stumbling around injuries obviously is going to be to use a flashlight of some kind, but I have something you need to think about if you use a flashlight while doing astronomy, you're going to ruin your night vision and the astronomer is going to be really mad at you. You all probably experience that when you go out at night, uh, after about five to 10 minutes, if you're young or 15 or 20 minutes when you're older, your eyes will adjust, your pupils will change size and allow more light in to allow you to see it in the dark. If you shine a flashlight in someone's eyes, they, the pupils will immediately contract, thus spoiling your night vision. So we don't want to use bright white flashlights. What we do in astronomy is we use red lights. And I'll do a demo of that later. Red lights don't really uh, cause your eyes to react. You can see well enough uh, with a red light. So if you have a, a little red flashlight, they make them. I'm going to demo one in a minute. Uh, you want to get one of those. And that way you can avoid stumbling around injuries, but not spoil your astronomy session. So using a red light. Uh, daytime viewing, there is astronomy during the day. It's mostly called solar astronomy. And as you can imagine, looking at the sun is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. You can permanently damage your eyes and you want to avoid anyone ever doing that. So uh, if you do not have the correct solar filter that they make in glasses or solar telescopes, uh, you simply cannot look at or anywhere near the sun during daylight hours. Uh, unless there's a full solar eclipse, but that's very rare and you'll be lucky to see one of those. Uh, you can use a pinhole camera, which is basically just a shoebox or something with a little hole in it. And you can uh, uh, broadcast a picture of the sun uh, onto a wall or the back of your box or whatever you want. So you can backlight it and not look directly at the sun. So one of the hazards of astronomy is don't look at the sun. And uh, obviously the, the thing to do uh, is protect your eyes uh, with uh, an approved solar filter or the little uh, eclipse glasses. Um, so the last thing I'm going to mention, uh, I, there are. We'll go through the one B here in a second. Is the use of lasers. Uh, you will see sometimes at night people will point lasers at the sky, and it's kind of cool to point out stars with those. They're they're kind of powerful green lasers. They're actually illegal and the FCC doesn't want us to use them because they can shine up all the way to where planes fly um, and so I really do not encourage people to use lasers. Uh, the green lasers are powerful ones they can damage your eyes so uh, you know when I see people play around with them like their toys I'm always worried that someone's eyes are going to get hit with those lasers and they can burn out the redness in the back of your eyes not regrow so uh, I think from a scouting perspective and a personal safety, if you see someone playing around with one of those lasers, you might ask them to put them away because they're not entirely safe. If someone uh, that knows what they're doing is using them, uh, they should always stay pointed at the sky and they shouldn't on continue to play with them. So on to 1B, uh, we'll go through these fairly quickly. Heat reactions, you know, shade and water and monitor for uh, uh, help in case you have you know, people going into shock due to heat prostration or something like that. Uh, you'll know that if, you know, the, there's this variety of symptoms, they get flushed, their skin is uh, dry, uh, and uh, they'll start acting funny. So uh, be careful if people get overheated. For cold, obviously the big risk is uh, frostbite. Uh, but if you can't feel your fingers and toes, uh, or the person you're treating can't feel their fingers and toes, that's the first stage on the way to injury. Uh, so immediately you want to get people warmed up from there. So you go inside, get a pair of gloves, warm up, uh, get them a hot drink, and you know, for them for, uh, in, you know, make sure they warm up after that. Dehydration is obviously get into the shade and sip some water. Um, dehydration can be quite serious. A lot of astronomy happens at high altitude. So if you're high in the mountains looking at the stars and you don't drink water, you can get dehydrated. Uh, and it can, it can come on quite quickly, just a few hours. Um, and uh, they will get woozy and dizzy, 
Uh, it's also a symptom of altitude sickness. So be sure that such people uh, get some water, they sit down. And if you're at high altitude and the person's not recovering, they have to get to lower altitude, obviously. Uh, bites and stings seems unlikely, but don't set up your telescope on a red anthill. Uh, if something does bite you, obviously identify what it is. There are scorpions and spiders in the outdoors and uh, you could get bitten. There are different ways to treat these. You know, if it's a bee sting, you can, you know, carefully scrape the stinger out. Um, if it's something serious like a rattlesnake, the, the standard treatments are, uh, you know, to uh, cool it off and, and get them to a hospital where they can get antivenin. Uh, damage to your eyes if someone's foolish enough to look at the sun or stare in a laser. You cover the eyes and get medical attention. Uh, C, describe the proper clothing and precautions for safely making observations at night in cold weather. Uh, these seem obvious to me, but they're part of the answer. So layers, hats and gloves, and a red light uh, uh, so that you can avoid stumbling around injuries. Uh, cold weather, you know, if it's gonna snow or ice, that's not a great night for astronomy. You're probably more concerned about staying safe than seeing the stars. Um, explain how to safely observe the sun we just covered. Basically, don't do it. Uh, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to do it, you must have a approved solar filter in your uh, optical instrument, which is, um, you know, uh, like sunglasses for a telescope. Uh, they have to be approved gel, or they'll let in too much light. Uh, if you don't have an approved device or filter. Uh, you have to use indirect methods of uh, looking at the sun or objects near the sun. So if you want to really see Mercury, don't point your binoculars at it. The sun is only, uh, uh, you know, a couple of fingers away. All you have to do is accidentally slide over and then the sun will shoot into your eyes. And through binoculars, you'll be magnifying it. Could you repeat the um, things you need to do to protect your uh, vision from looking at the sun? Don't do it. Uh, so don't look at the sun. That seems don't obvious. Don't look at the sun directly. Don't look at the sun directly. And therefore, how, what can you do if you're doing solar observation? Okay, I just said that you have to have an approved gel filter like the eclipse glasses or filter for a telescope. Um, and if you do not have those things, you can only use indirect methods, which are using a pinhole camera to uh, broadcast a, a a picture of the sun into uh, onto a wall or the back of something. So don't look at the sun, direct observation only with an approved uh, uh, filter or direct observation, indirect observation, pinhole cameras are fine. All right. So that's all of number one. If you got enough notes or you're filling it out as you go, you've completed a requirement for the astronomy merit badge. We're now gonna go on to number two. Light pollution, what is light pollution? It may seem odd to you to call uh, light pollution, but uh, if you have ever been up to Mount Wilson or up in the foothills and look down in LA, you see this vast basin of thousands and thousands and thousands of lights. And all that light is being shined up into the night sky. It hits dust particles, uh, it clouds, haze, other things in the upper atmosphere, and it creates a glow in the sky we call sky glow. And that sky glow from light pollution is actually brighter than most of the stars, galaxies, and other things, the Milky Way. So in light polluted areas, you basically can't see much of anything. We're gonna be doing a little bit of observing tonight, but I'm only gonna direct you to uh, magnitude one or brighter stars tonight, because those are really the only stars we have a hope of seeing. I hope everyone on the call either has had or will have a chance to go camping in the mountains or the deserts of Southern California where the, uh, the night sky is beautiful and you can see thousands and thousands of stars in the Milky Way. It's, if you've never seen it, it's quite a sight for the first time. Uh, this is a form of pollution in a couple of senses. Um, most particularly, if you think about it, you know, we burn train loads of coal that pollute our atmosphere to generate all that light and uh, just shining it up in the night sky is a complete and total waste of resources and it messes up the night sky. And as an astronomer, I think we should not do that. Um, we do have a, a lot of new kinds of lights that use less electricity and point downward rather than shine in all directions. 
and this is a big improvement uh, to uh, uh, reducing light pollution. So some of the world's most famous astronomy uh, uh, observatories are right here in Southern California, but due to light pollution, they have been ruined and no further research can happen at them because they simply can't see any of the faint objects that the scientists want to look at. Um, Mount Wilson can still has pretty good night sky, but they, uh, they can't see the faintest galaxies from Mount Wilson anymore. Uh, the, the 200 inch down at Palomar, which is about an hour or two away if you want to go camping and do a really fun astronomy trip. Uh, the Palomar Observatory, they built an Indian casino down at the base of the mountain and damaged the night vision of that uh, a telescope. They can still do a lot with it, but the best places in the world for astronomy are going to be the darkest places out in the desert, uh, high in the mountains. Uh, in places like northern Arizona, the California desert, uh, the mountains of Chile, uh, and of course the famous observatory uh, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, uh, which is so high and there's no pollution. It's uh, one of the finest observatories in the whole world. So that's what light pollution is. <laughs> it's created by humans. All the car lots and restaurants and uh, street lights and all those uh, wasted light shining up into the night sky <clears throat> making sky glow and making it impossible to see the objects against that sky glow. Even if you have a really good telescope, you can make out more stars, but the sky glow is going to harm you from seeing fainter objects like the Milky Way, um, galaxies and that sort of thing. So uh, that's how air pollution can affect astronomy. Uh, oh, air pollution. So how does air pollution affect? Obviously, if you have a bunch of air pollution, it, it's going to have multiple effects. One, is it's gonna block you know, the light coming from the stars down to the earth, but it's also gonna reflect sky glow back down. So uh, air pollution exacerbates uh, sky pollution or light pollution. And uh, so air pollution is not only bad for our health, it's also bad for seeing the night sky. And you know, our, our grandfathers and great grandfathers grew up here in America seeing the night sky from where they, they grew up every night. And we're much more familiar, you know, when I go out and do uh, outreach events at Los Angeles uh, Unified School District schools, a lot of times the, the school kids there have never seen a star in the night sky. The very first thing they ever see is through my telescope. So I, I like to share that because there is a certain beauty and grandeur to the night sky. And I'm not a fan of light pollution. I think it's a waste of resources and it ruins uh, our vision of what's overhead at night. Okay, so that should get you to number two. Um, there's more in your Astronomy Merit Badge book about light pollution, but uh, you just fill that in in your worksheet, um, and uh, you're done with number two. So moving on to number three. Astronomical instruments. Okay. All right. So, uh, no, so got feedback. hey, Spencer, you need to mute yourself. Okay. So, we got ammo coming what, up. What was that uh, echo? What was that echo? It, it was someone not on mute. If everyone goes on mute, there will be no echo. Oh, strange. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, number three with the aid of diagrams, do each of the following. Explain why binoculars and telescopes are important astronomical tools. Well, if you think about it, your eye is about a quarter of an inch across, so it can gather only so much light and only make out so much detail. If you could gather more light and make your eye bigger around, you would be being more sensitive to faint objects. So objects like telescopes and binoculars, not only do they gather more light, that is they're bigger around and allow more light in, they concentrate that light into a smaller area, thus allowing you to use an eyepiece and magnify. So it's a combination of light gathering and magnification, allowing you to see objects that you can't see with your, your naked eye. And that's why they're such important astronomical tools, because they allow us to study and measure and see objects that you can't see with your, your naked eye. Uh, so demonstrate or explain how these tools are used. I'm going to be doing that in our demonstration area, um, and uh, we'll do that afterwards. But the demonstration is basically 
you know, you point the objective end at the object in the sky you want to look at. You either put your eye or another instrument back at the eyepiece and the incoming light uh, is how you do that. So you just have to carefully aim your telescope or your binoculars uh, and they will let you see what you can't see, you know, with your regular eyes. Okay. Uh, B, describe similarities and differences between several types of astronomical telescopes. So that's on the screen right now. The two, the two top ones are probably the ones that I want you to describe most carefully. They're the most important categories. So I'm gonna talk about those for a second. So the answer here is refractor and reflector. Those are the two kinds. There are a few other kinds, we'll talk about them in a second, but the two basic kinds of ways to gather light is through refraction or reflection. So let's talk about refracting telescopes first. Binoculars are an example of refracting telescopes because they're, they're two refracting telescopes side by side with little mirrors to bring the light together uh, with your eyes. So what is a refracting telescope? A refracting telescope uses a curved piece of glass called a lens in the very front. We call that the primary lens. And if you've ever used a magnifying glass, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What a magnifying glass does is it bends or curves the light into a smaller cone and concentrates it. So you could have a large primary lens, uh, you know, for a small telescope, four, five, six inches is pretty good size. Obviously big research telescopes are much larger, but the largest refracting telescopes are uh, about 30 inches across. Any bigger than that and the primary lens just won't function properly. So how do you tell a refracting telescope? Uh, there'll be a big piece of glass right in the front. So if you look at a pair of binoculars, there's big pieces of glass, curved pieces of glass right in the front of both sides. A refracting telescope will be a long narrow tube like the diagram on the screen. The incoming light passes through the primary lens, concentrates it at the back, and then you look through an eyepiece at the back. So that's what a refracting telescope, we call it refracting because uh, curved glass refracts light or bends it. Uh, and that's how that works, just like a magnifying glass. The second kind of telescope is called a reflector. A reflector has no primary lens in the front. It lets all the light in all the way down to the bottom and has, it uses, instead of lenses, it uses a mirror. A curved mirror bounces the light uh, back into a cone that concentrates it where you can look through it. So I'll show you some examples of reflecting telescope. So what I want you to learn from this is if it's a refractor, it uses a lens, so it has curved glass in the front. If it's a reflector, which literally means mirror, uh, it has a piece of curved glass at the back and no lens, and it bounces the, uh, the light up to the front. The first telescope that was invented by Galileo was a refracting telescope. It was a little tube, like a thing that you look through uh, like a, on a sea ship, right? But he was the first person to see the craters of the moon and the moons of Jupiter. No human being had ever saw them before. Uh, a few years later, a famous gentleman by the name of Isaac Newton invented reflecting telescopes. What's cool about reflecting telescopes, the ones that use mirrors, uh, they can be much, much bigger than refracting telescopes. So the 100 inch uh, reflecting telescope at Mount Wilson, the largest telescope in the world for some 50 years, uh, the, the telescope I'm gonna demo that I have is a reflecting telescope, has a 10 inch mirror, so it's quite large, but the one at Mount Wilson is 100 inches across and the entire device is the size of a school bus. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is a reflector, and the 200 inch at Mount Palomar is a reflector. All the big telescopes are reflectors because to be that big and gather enough light to say, see the faintest galaxies at the origin of the universe, you need a really big mirror to gather as much light as possible. So there's a few other devices I've listed here. Uh, going on to, to see, I, I will mention there's a third kind of telescope called a catadioptric which is a combination of both uh, refracting and reflecting. So it has a refracting glass in the front, but a mirror in the back. So I guess the third kind is, uh, you call it a, a hybrid or a combo type telescope. And we can show you, I think 
uh, Spencer's telescope, which he's going to de demonstrate for us tonight, is that type. So you can see those as well. So one of the most important instruments associated with astronomy is going to be the mount, because the mount is how you point the telescope at the sky. And you can imagine, since things in the sky are moving, you're going to want the ability to smoothly move your telescope in unison with the sky. So the mount is super important, right? If your telescope is just fixed and it doesn't move, as you stare through it, things are gonna slowly move across it. It isn't the night sky that's moving, it's actually you're watching the Earth rotate. And if you point a powerful telescope at Jupiter, uh, you will actually only see it for about five seconds. It will just drift right across the screen. And that, you're actually seeing the Earth rotate. Um, so mounts that have drive motors and gears that allow you to move the telescope help you to align it. There are uh, two basic kinds of mounts. Um, the one in the diagram on the screen, you can see those counterweights and then there's a little barrel spinner that allows the telescope to spin around. That barrel spinner is pointed right at the North Star. It's called aligning your telescope. And then by rotating around that axis, you can keep it pointed on the objects as they move. That is called a polar or equatorial mount. Uh, and we call it a polar mount because it points at the North Star. The other kind, Alt-Az or Dobsonian, are very basic mounts, and they just go up, down, left, right, uh, and uh, that's the kind I have. So I have to keep moving my telescope every night. Um, uh, did someone have a question? Oh, okay, great. All right, so mounts are a very important astronomical instrument, right? A telescope by itself is impossible to use. Uh, my 10-inch telescope is almost as big as I am. Obviously, you can't lift it up with your hands and look through it. You need a mount. Uh, so we'll demo that for you. Some other instruments I've listed here are uh, a finder scope, because if you're looking at the sky through, you know, a, a large telescope, you're looking at a tiny, tiny, tiny patch of sky. It's like looking at the sky through a coffee stirrer. Uh, you're going to need a finder scope to help you find stuff. It's going to be less magnification, and astronomers, both professional and amateur, uh, use finder scopes. There's a wide variety of them. I'll demo the ones on mine. And finder scopes are used to help you find things. Obviously, you can put a camera. Uh, these days, you know, a digital astronomical camera uh, can go on a telescope and, and you can take pictures. And the amazing thing about taking pictures is you can do long exposures, which means you can gather more light and see way more detail. Uh, another important instrument that you would attach to a telescope would be a spectrometer. Um, as you guys are probably aware, if you shine light through a prism, uh, it breaks the light into its different color components or wavelengths, you know, from the, uh, the red all the way to the blue, uh, through yellow and orange. And uh, a spectrometer does the same thing. It breaks the light up just like a prism and allows you to measure the amount of the different wavelengths of light. And this is how we tell what objects are made of. Uh, in the night sky because different elements of uh, chemistry shine in different colors. So when you see fireworks bursting in all different colors, a chemist can actually name the chemicals that made those different colors because uh, that's how you tell what element made them, right? Uh, and so by shining a telescope at, say, a star, putting a prism or spectrometer behind it, we can measure uh, what elements are in that star and understand more about how stars are created and they blow up and they die and all that stuff. Uh, there are other wavelengths. The electromagnetic spectrum of wavelength goes all the way through all these things you can't see with your eye. So microwave radiation, radio waves, television broadcasts, x-rays, these are all the exact same phenomena as visible light. They're just at greater or lesser wavelengths that you can't see with your eye. So we can put instruments on our telescopes to measure uh, wavelengths beyond the visible. So you might have an infrared detector that you could put on a telescope or a ultraviolet detector that you could put on a telescope. If you want to detect the radio waves coming from quasars, radio waves have really big wavelengths, right? They're really long. Uh, and so a tiny little dish isn't going to do it. So when you see those huge dishes that are, you know, 50 feet across or 100 feet across, radio telescopes to detect the faint radio emissions uh, from objects in the sky. Um, so 
Uh, there are different types of devices that you can uh, attach to a telescope uh, to detect different wavelengths of light. And again, there's a lot of scientific interest in that and all that. So finally, uh, D, describe the proper care and storage. So obviously these mirrors and these lenses are, uh, you know, they're created and coded to uh, a one hundredth of a millimeter or less than a hair perfection. If you scratch them up, they don't work right. Um, if you uh, uh, leave them out in the hot sun, then they get messed up. So obviously you wanna care for your optical instruments. You know, for binoculars, they can take a little abuse. You just put the cups back on the front and the back, put them in their little carrying case and that, that's gonna take care of them. If you leave them out or you set them on the table face down and it scratches them up, they aren't gonna lose well. Um, huge telescopes, you know, when I'm working up at Ford Observatory, it takes us about a half an hour to put the covers on the telescope and, you know, park it to store it carefully for the night. That is an 18 inch mirror and it's over 100 years old and you can see amazing things in it, but it requires some care. We have to cover up the telescope so no dust gets on the optical elements. So proper care and storage, you know, if you do buy a telescope, obviously it'll come with a user's guide. You want to follow the directions in there. Put the cover on the front, put it in its carrying case, uh, and make sure it's covered. So uh, that's everything on number three, astronomical instruments. Uh, we will be doing some demos for this stuff. I have some other pictures in there that you can see. There's a, uh, a box of eyepieces. Eyepieces have different filters. They have different levels of magnification. So eyepieces are another type of instrument. And I'm also showing you that the guy that created that little carrying case is very carefully taking care of his telescope and its parts by storing them in a little form kite place, like you would a camera or something, right? And what's my little picture in the lower left? I can't see it, Carolyn. Is that an observatory? What, in the lower right? Yeah. Oh, that's the... Um, what is it? Like a, what is a it? kick uh, antenna. Oh, it's a radio telescope. Uh -huh. Okay. So there's a picture of a radio telescope in the lower right of the slide. You can see that it takes a different kind of instrument to detect long wavelengths like radio waves. Uh, okay, so I think that's everything. Hopefully you got enough notes for your packet. Obviously your merit badge book covers all of this. Um, if you need additional notes, I'll send you guys a link if you wanna come back to the, uh, the slides or watch this again later. So I'm gonna move on now to number four. Oh, wait, I got some slides of some other telescopes here first. Uh, yeah. So here is a reflecting telescope. Again, this is back on the types of telescopes. These are just some examples for you. Um, I had a slide for the refracting telescope. These are reflecting telescopes. <coughs> There's a diagram in the upper right that shows you how different the light path is. A reflecting telescope has no glass in front. It allows the light in all the way to the bottom, bounces off a curved mirror, back up the tube, then a secondary mirror kicks the light out the side where you can put an eyepiece and look at it with your eye or put a camera or whatever. The two big uh, telescopes I pictured here, the one on the left is the 60 inch at Mount Wilson above us here in Pasadena. This is probably one of the most famous telescopes in the world, second only to the 100 inch at the same observatory. This was the first large reflecting telescope ever built. Uh, it was built back in the 1920s, actually in the early teens. Uh, and it, uh, in order to rotate, it is so heavy uh, that they could not use actual gears. So that giant thing set in the floor is a, a liquid mercury bath. And the telescope floats in the mercury like ice and water, uh, which is a totally amazing way. So there are no gears. It moves so smoothly you could move it with one finger. It's a totally amazing telescope. And it looks really cool. Uh, you can visit that telescope up at Mount Wilson, uh, and this is one of the telescopes that Edwin Hubble used to explore the galaxies and figure out that uh, the universe is really large and that the Big Bang happened. Uh, obviously, most of you will recognize the Hubble Space Telescope. It is also a reflecting telescope. There's no big lens in the front. It goes around the Earth, so it's kind of complicated on taking pictures, but they have compensating servos for all of that. And there's a mirror in the back of that, and it has digital cameras that take the pictures and then beam them down us, to us here on Earth. All right, constellations and stars. How are we doing on time, Carolyn? Um, 
Not yet, right? Okay, great. All right, so uh, constellations and stars. So let me get my little thing here. All right, so the night sky, we already covered this. The, the stars slowly circle overhead at night. And the question is, and, and we'll, we'll get to the slides that have the actual answers you want. I, these are just general things in understanding. The stars slowly circle overhead at night, going around the pole star like a giant disc overhead. Uh, it takes 24 hours for one complete rotation. If you think about it, the sun rises in the east. So does everything else. The planets rise in the east. The stars rise in the east. Everything rises in the east. And everything sets in the west. So the sun sets in the west towards the ocean here in Southern California. But so do all the planets and so do all the stars. Everything rotates around at night. Uh, so when, th when I say things rise, you know, I mean, as the night progresses, more things uh, rise on the eastern horizon, and then they set behind us on the western horizon. Uh, and everything rotates around the pole star, which you'll remember is Polaris in the Little Dipper or Ursa Minor. And finding the pole star is one of the classical scout ways of figuring out what direction is north and what latitude you're at and some other direction finding skills. A constellation is a group of stars in the sky that look like something to someone. Uh, a lot of these go back to mythology, but constellation just means group of stars or grouping of stars. So if you've heard of the constellation Scorpius, which happens to be uh, in the southeast uh, right now, uh, you can see the red giant Antares at the beating heart of the Scorpio constellation tonight. Um, I give points for anyone that can manage to see Antares. It is a magnitude one star, so it is visible in LA in the southeast horizon tonight. Uh, but there are other constellations. You probably heard of the constellations of the Zodiac, um, which uh, the ancient Greeks uh, originally named. And the constellations of the Zodiac just happen to be the ones in the ecliptic. So when Jupiter goes across the ecliptic slowly or Venus, so it, it'll be, you know, Venus is in Sagittarius. That's just because the planet happens to be in that grouping of stars while it drifts around the ecliptic. Um, I don't know if it means anything from astrology, but from astronomy, understanding how the night sky works and how planets move around. Uh, so uh, people recognize constellations, uh, you know, by their shape. Um, obviously, uh, one that I've already pointed out to you on your sky map is Sagittarius. Sagittarius is in the, the zodiac, it's on the ecliptic. It's also on the Milky Way in the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So if you're looking at that galaxy map right now, we're in one of the spiral arms about halfway off on the left. Looking in towards the center of the Milky Way is in the direction of Sagittarius. What is Sagittarius? It's just a pattern of stars in that direction. It happened to look like a teapot. Um, doesn't mean anything other than that. The shapes are random but it does help you like locate where Sagittarius is because you could say, oh, well, it's uh, you know, two degrees uh, to the right of the spout of the teapot of Sagittarius, and that would help you find it in the night sky. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy is a pretty amazing thing, so I'll introduce a few concepts here. Um, so what is the speed of light? I mean, light it actually is, it has a measurable speed. Uh, they made these amazing devices to measure it. Uh, you can learn about that in a physics class. Um, but it's 670 million miles per hour. So no car that you could ever think of could even, you just can't, it's a, it's a magnitude, right? It's just in one hour, that's 670 million miles. That's past Jupiter and well on the way to Saturn in one hour. Uh, in a second, it's 200, it's 186,000 and some odd miles per second. So in one second, a light beam can circle the Earth multiple times. Uh, so the light is very, very fast. It also, the speed of light helps us measure things. Uh, so we would call a light year the amount of time it takes, the, the distance that a light beam travels in one year is called a light year. And uh, how, how big is a light year? Uh, a 10 trillion kilometers. Uh, another measurement we call our astronomical units. The distance of the Earth from the Sun is one astronomical unit, uh, and Jupiter is out at five astronomical units. So Jupiter is five times as far from the Sun as the Earth is. Uh, it does depend a little bit uh, on what time of year. The orbits do change a bit, but that's an average. 
uh, a light year is 63,000 astronomical units. So in one year, a light beam can travel away from the sun uh, 63,000 times further from the sun than the earth. So that's a huge, huge thing. So on uh, galactic distances measured up at Mount Wilson by Edwin Hubble uh, and figuring out the Milky Way. Um, the Milky Way is about 13 billion years old. It's about 100,000 light years across and it's only about 1,000 light years thick. So it's more like a thin pancake. Uh, and it's, it is, has spiral arms, it is slowly spinning, uh, and it takes uh, millions of years for a rotation. There are about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is an astounding number you almost can't wrap your mind around. But considering that there are billions and billions of galaxies, it's kind of mind blowing. Uh, so those are some distance for you. The, the whole solar system, Pluto is out at about 40 AUs, or 40 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, Pluto got demoted because they started finding these other things out there just like Pluto or very similar to Pluto and they didn't want to make them all planets so they changed it to dwarf planet. Uh, Sedna is out there, way out there in the Oort cloud, icy little objects. Uh, Sedna is at 90 astronomical units, way out there. The comet that is currently in the night sky that you can see with binoculars, I was observing it over the weekend with my naked eye, it was just amazing. Uh, it's right now, it's up and below Ursa Major over in the uh, northern one, northern horizon. Uh, it came in from the uh, Oort cloud out beyond Pluto, and it's on its way. It just passed the Earth, headed back out. It'll be back in 6,600 years, so you only get one chance to see that comet uh, in your lifetime. But uh, yeah, the ones that go way out uh, beyond Pluto they have long elliptical orbits and they take a long time to come back in. When they're racing around the earth and in, around the sun and back, they're moving really fast and they have tails. And so they are uh, pretty cool objects. I hope you got a chance to see it if you, if you didn't. There, it is still visible if you have binoculars, points for anyone that can uh, still see it. It's fading a little bit now, but it's up by Ursa Major uh, and uh, about 25, 20, 25 degrees above the horizon. Okay, so let's go on to which constellations we're gonna do. So uh, number four is your constellation and stars. I'm giving you examples here. You don't have to use these, feel free to. So the name of the constellation followed by a magnitude one star in it. So I've kind of combined the two together. Uh, Ursa Minor, we already talked about, you found it on your star map. The stars of Ursa Minor are almost too faint to see in the city but Polaris is not. So if you can find Polaris, you're in Ursa Minor. Polaris is the pole star. It is a magnitude one star. It is visible from the city as soon as it gets dark. Uh, Ursa Major, which is also called the Big Dipper, has a bright star in it called Mizar. So there's a great easy to spot constellation in the northern sky and another one of your uh, magnitude one stars. Uh, the uh, three summer stars, Arcturus, Vega, and Deneb, are up and to the right in the night sky in the summer. All three of these stars are very bright. Vega is the brightest blue white, Arcturus is a red giant, uh, and Deneb is in Cygnus in the Milky Way. The constellations which are on your star map are Boots, Lyra, and Cygnus. So finding the summer triangle, it's a huge triangle of three bright stars in the overhead night sky. Um, points for uh, locating all three of those are Turgus, Vega, and De Deneb. Uh, if you look at them for a minute, Vega will be blue-white and Arcturus will be a faint orangey-red. And you probably never thought of stars as having color, but give your eyes a minute to adjust and you may be able to tell the difference. Uh, Aquila is an Altair, the other way around. Altair is an Aquila. Uh, that one is visible right now in the summer sky. It's on your star map. And uh, the Eagle, uh, Aquila is the Eagle nebula, uh, constellation. Altair is a Mag 1 star in Aquila. Uh, two stars in Gemini, which is not currently visible. It's around the other side of the Earth right now. But you get two bright Mag 1 stars, Castor and Pollux, very, very visible in the zodiac. Gemini is the constellation. Leo's off to the right setting right now. You might spot Regulus if you look off towards where the sun is going down. Uh, and that's another one. Uh, Leo has the big lion head, and it's on your star map. Uh, Virgo is, I think, off the horizon right now. I have to look at my star map. But the bright star in Virgo is uh, Spica. 
I don't think you're going to see Virgo tonight. Uh, Scorpio is in the uh, it's in the southern horizon right now, towards the southwest a little bit. Uh, it is very visible right now, close to the horizon. You'll see it has three stars in the head and a long curled tail. Uh, and right in the heart of Scorpius is the blinking red giant Antares. Points for spotting the red giant Antares beating heart of Scorpius tonight. You should be able to see it once the sun goes down. So I'm giving you a list of things. A lot of these you can see right now. Uh, and there are some other uh, stars in your scout book or on your star map. I'm trying to give you things that are visible in the city so you have a good chance to spot them. If you go out camping, you can see a lot more stars. Um, and uh, right now, Jupiter is over in the, uh, let's see, east. So yeah, Jupiter's kind of coming up in the east and rotating up and to the right near Sagittarius and Scorpius. So looking off to the southeast tonight, uh, you, you would have a good chance to see Jupiter rising real close to the horizon right now. And then to the right, uh, Sagittarius, and then to the right of that, Scorpius. Um, how do you tell the difference between a plane and a star and a planet uh, when you're looking at the night sky? So planes have, uh, planes move, stars don't, not, not that fast. Planes have blinky lights that turn on and off. Stars and planets don't do that. Um, a star, though, will twinkle a little. Now, it doesn't blink. It twinkles, which means it kind of, you know, vibrates a little and makes a little twinkly point. Uh, so things that twinkle are stars. Planets do not twinkle. Planets are disks. Now, I know that when you look at Saturn, it just looks like a star to you because Saturn is really, really far away. Saturn is the slightly yellowish star to the left of Jupiter, but it's not a star. The, the disks don't twinkle, they're too big. So Jupiter, and if you're looking at a bright object in the sky and it's not moving and it's not twinkling, uh, it's probably a planet and you should figure out which planet it is. The brightest planet is Venus over near the sun, obviously. Uh, and uh, the bright one in the sky tonight is Jupiter. There's nothing as bright as Jupiter. Once you've seen Jupiter and go, oh, that's gotta be something different because it looks like a flashlight shining in the sky. Of course, it's not nearly big as the moon, uh, but it's a very, very bright object in the sky. With a telescope, you can see the moons of Jupiter, you can see the red spot, you can see the storms and all that stuff. So Jupiter's a pretty cool object to look at. Uh, okay, so that's 4A and 4B. Um, you're gonna use your star map during our break tonight to go out and see uh, if you can find, I mean, I challenge you to find at least one thing. Vega is probably the, the brightest uh, nearly overhead. That means looking more or less straight up. Uh, that's a blue-white star of magnitude one. Even at sundown, that's one of the first stars to come out. Uh, so when you come back from break uh, and you take your star map outside, um, you're going to be typing in the chat. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what stars do you write down and what magnitudes are them? Uh, so all the stars I put on there, Vega is going to be the brightest star that you're going to be on your list. Uh, the magnitude is a logarithmic scale, but the lower numbers are brighter and the higher numbers are dimmer. So uh, a magnitude zero is Vega, really bright star. Magnitude one is it a bright star, but not as bright as Vega. Uh, has, a magnitude 10 it has, object. It has, to be, it has to be one or brighter. Yeah, all those, all those on the list that I have on the screen right now are ones or better. Then I thought those were the constellations. No, the constellations, the, the stars are in parentheses. See what I'm saying? So the first one says Ursa Minor. Ursa Minor is a constellation, and the magnitude one star in Ursa Minor is in parentheses. It's called Polaris. Does that make sense? Um, let me write this down real quick. Yeah, all this is in your merit badge book as well. So I'm going to have to move off the slide in a second. I've left it up for a while, but, uh, you know, if you Wait. want to use the stars I'm listing for you, you've got 10 constellations and 10 stars right here on this list. Actually, 11 stars. Wait, so for the constellations, which ones should the I write? You're looking at the names. You can use either your star map. Oh, you okay. I see. 
or you can use like on the screen right now that I'm sharing, the constellations are Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Boots, Lyra, Cygnus, Aquila, Gemini, Leo, Virgo, and Scorpio. That's 10 constellations right there. The stars are Polaris, Mizar, Arcturus, Vega, Deneb, Altair, Castor and Pollux, Regulus, Spica, and Antares. The reason I organized it this way is you'll, so, you'll know which stars are in which constellations. So Polaris is in Ursa Minor, Mizar is in Ursa Major, Arcturus is in Boots. That's how that works. And those are all magnitude one stars. So if you, if you see the white star Vega overhead tonight, you're looking at the constellation Lyra, which is actually on your star map. But the other stars in Lyra, Lyra is a tiny little uh, constellation right overhead near Hercules. You'll see it on your star map, Vega. That's probably the star you'll see in that one. Okay, so yeah, I mean, in, for 4A and 4B, you're writing in the names of constellations, and then you're writing in names of stars. And the information on the screen that is there, or you can use your star map or your merit badge book. Okay? Are all these magnitude one? Are the stars all magnitude ones? Yes, every star in parentheses on the screen right now is a magnitude one star. Except for Vega, which is a magnitude zero and is brighter than a magnitude yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, Vega is brighter than magnitude one. All right, I'll leave it up for another minute, James, in case you're, you guys are copying it down. Oh, I'm done. Finish. Okay. There are other constellations. You don't have to use my list. You know, if you list winter constellations that you're familiar with, I have no problem with that. A lot of you may be familiar with Orion. There's some famous stars in Orion. Uh, Taurus, there's a, a winter constellation uh, in the zodiac called Taurus. Obviously, you could list that one. So you don't have to use the constellations I'm giving you. But since we're going to try some observing tonight, I thought I'd try and give you some that you might have a shot to see those stars tonight. Okay. Uh, so that brings us up to C, your Big Dipper maps. If you have a dark sky and we wait till it's fairly dark out, you should be able to see the Big Dipper in the northern horizon. Uh, make two sketches of the Big Dipper showing it rotating around. Uh, if you go out one to two hours, it'll move, you know, like 12 degrees or so. So it'll just be in a slightly different position. That's all 4C is. So 4C is going to be two drawings of the Big Dipper at two different times. Uh, and you, that's one of the prerequisites and you've got to do it. Uh, 4D, let's see. Do I, uh, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go back here. Uh, previous. Okay, so 4D is explain what you see when we look at the Milky Way. I explained that earlier. You're looking at uh, billions and billions of stars in the shape of a pancake. And by looking out at the night sky, you're actually looking out in different directions and you're seeing the Milky Way. It's also on your star map and I showed you a map. So the Milky Way is a giant group of stars that is our galaxy and there are other galaxies like Andromeda and things like that. But Milky Way is our galaxy, it's our neighborhood. It's absolutely gigantic, 100,000 light years across. Uh, we're about halfway out from the center in one of the spiral arms. When we look towards Sagittarius, you're looking towards the center. When you look the opposite direction, you know, out towards Taurus, you're looking out, uh, uh, you know, towards the outer rim of the galaxy, if that makes sense. Um, the Milky Way appears a milky white nebulosity, but uh, in fact, if you get a telescope and you look and you get bigger and bigger telescopes looking at the Milky Way, all you see is more and more stars. That milky whiteness is just all those tiny little stars and nebulas combine into what looks like to the eye, kind of cloudy whiteness. Um, so that's the appearance of the Milky Way, but in fact, it's almost all stars, just stars, millions and millions of stars in a giant uh, wheel or pancake shape. Um, although some recent research that I learned about from Tim showed that the edges are a little bit curled up and down, and they haven't quite figured that out yet. Maybe one of you scouts will figure out why the galaxy is a little bit bent. Uh, the astronomers, I think they're still arguing about that. Uh, I read an article in Sky and Telescope that said maybe it was because we encountered another galaxy sometime in the past and it, it bent the edge of the galaxy a little bit. But they just now discovered that, or recently. Okay, so uh, do we want to take our break now? Uh, do our demo now, Carolyn? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I mean, I should probably do number five just so. Uh, um, number five is list the names of the five most visible planets. By the five most visible planets, that means the ones you can see with your naked eye, right? The ones you can spot just looking at the sky. Obviously, you're not going to see Neptune. It's really, really far away. Uh, so the five planets, uh, there are three inner planets. Uh, well, I guess four if you count Earth. Uh, Mercury and Venus are the ones in towards the sun, and they have phases, right? Because if Mercury is on one side of the sun or the other, it's going to be a half Mercury or a half Venus, just like our moon does. Uh, but the planets that are out from the Earth don't do that, right? When you're looking at Mars, you're always seeing pretty much a whole Mars. So Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are the answers to... 5A, uh, Venus and Mercury have phases, and the reason is because they're in towards the sun, and Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn don't have phases because they're out further, and they don't ever, you don't ever see a, a half Jupiter, because it's... the asterisk where it says Mars inner asterisk mean? Oh, uh, so Mars, it, it's an inner planet, but it's further out from the sun than we are. So I put an asterisk there because it, it's an inner planet but doesn't have phases because if you look at the diagram, it goes Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. So the two inner planets that are closer to the sun are Mercury and Venus. The inner planet that's further from the sun than the Earth is Mars. Wait, are we doing 5B? 5A right now. Spencer, okay. Okay. We want him to do the demo before it's too dark for him to oh, do the demo. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So, uh, guys, we'll take a break from the workbook and we're going to do some demos. Um, I'm going to go to Spencer first. Uh, Spencer Suhu is joining us tonight from the Astronomical Society. He has an amazing telescope. Uh, he's going to be doing a live demo of it and we're going to be looking through that telescope uh, in real time. But uh, I got to stop sharing, of course. Yep. And so Spencer's going to show you his telescope. You can uh, apply some of the knowledge that you've already gained about what kind of telescopes there are and all that. So Spencer, if you want to okay, share. Okay, well, actually, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Hmm. Can, you hear, is, can uh, you hear us, Spencer? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure you guys are hearing me. Type it here. Um, are you able to see the telescope? You, Spencer, but I'm but apparently you can't hear you're us. Not, you're yeah, not. yeah, I can hear you. You're okay, not. good. I can hear and see the telescope. Okay, okay look at the. Oh. Let me let me see if I can't share that video feed. All right. Okay, well, look at my picture. I guess that, that, that's, that's what you have to do. Uh, so it's a thumbnail on the monitor. Uh, I'm having trouble sharing this thing. You have to work that out. So that's the, uh, are you guys able to see this telescope now? Yeah, if you guys click on speaker view, it'll make his thing bigger. And you're looking at a picture of the telescope he's gonna use tonight. So what can you tell us about that telescope, uh, Spencer? Okay, this is the, uh, it's, called, it's a catadioptric. It's uh, what you described earlier. So if you look here, and this is a hybrid, so you've got a piece of glass in front, so it's a small corrector. It's a, basically a, a small lens. And so the light comes in through here. Um, take a note of this big ring at the top for, for a second, uh, or just keep that in mind. So the light comes in through here. It's actually four, bent a little bit, and then it hits a curved mirror at the back. So it hits that mirror, and you can actually see the, the reflection. Hits that mirror, comes back up to a small mirror that's right in, the, right in here. So then, then it goes back down through the uh, a hole in the mirror in the back. And so from there, it to, uh, um, it comes down. I've got something a mirror and comes out to there.
So Spencer, um, you're, uh, got a little bit of lag from your site there. So, um, I'm just going to, uh, so scouts, what you're seeing there is a, a large, I think it's an eight or 10 inch of uh, catadioptric combination refractor reflector. The back you saw, he right. had both a lens and a camera. Uh, so he can look through it with his eye or flip the mirror and look through it with the camera, which we're doing tonight. Did any of you recognize what kind of mount that was? It had the counterweights and it rotates. So that was an equatorial mount. So his has motors in it that track the night sky and stay really steady on a single object. That's called tracking on an equatorial mount. So that's a really nice telescope and an amazing setup. Yeah. And okay. so, uh, go ahead. Light uh, angle that superimposes an actually, and then this is a uh, camera. A camera hooked up to a small scope. So it's uh, again, this is used for tracking because even though. I get lined up with the Earth's axis. Uh, there's going to be some slippage because of backlash in the gears and whatnot. And so this actually connects up to a program that's on my computer. And when I find a star, I said lock on that star. So it makes micro movements on the on the on the uh, telescope mount to keep that star centered. So that's that lets you get uh, take images for long periods of time, several minutes, without any drift. Okay, so that's. Um, and this other, this is another scope that I set up. It's, uh, does you guys recognize this? It's an alt azimuth mount. And it's the same idea, but uh, it will actually, this is computerized too. So it moves in both axes to uh, track something in the sky. So I'm going to try using this one for Jupiter tonight. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think uh, we're going to go to the live demo here at the house, Carolyn. I'm going to go on, should I, should I stay off of mute so, and turn it towards there? How do I, I want to share my screen, but I can't. A lot of lag is happening. Can't really hear you. Wait, what is, <coughs> what is, okay. Um. Is the one screen sharing? Because I can't see it. Wait, can you guys hear me? Yep. Can you? Okay, something's weird's happening.
Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, something weird is happening to my computer. There's a bunch of lag. And Mr. Thompson's on mute. Wait, the golf one? What? Wait, are we on our break? No, we're not on break. We're just having a few technical uh, difficulties. I'm trying to get back to that. Okay. All right. Uh, it's getting dark. Yeah, we'll take a break in just a second. I mean, maybe we should take our break now while Carolyn figures this out. Is it dark enough to see stars? I think it's getting close. Uh, uh, can't, can't quite make out Vega yet. Yeah, well, well, let me advice. try and get the... Uh, How long is the break for? 15 minutes. Okay. But not we're not taking a break yet. I'm still trying to get something something went wrong here. Also on the app on my dad on my dad's phone, it said the International Space Station will be northwest. Okay. I guess the way we're gonna have to do is just Well, I can just spin this around. I mean if you absolutely have no way to get the camera up. You did it before, it worked fine. Okay. Um, then Mute yourself. I'm going to turn up my mic. And I'm going to unmute. And I'm going to unmute. There we go. And we'll just spin this around and see if it works. All right, start talking, Mr. Thompson. The camera is there. Up there. And that should show you. I, I mean, let's see. Okay, um, it doesn't work. I can't see anything. That one has to be audio and visual off. I still don't see anything. Now start talking and let's see if you can get this camera to turn on. I don't see anything. You're, you're messing me up. Okay, you're totally then messing. no, there's no way to do it. Um, So, so use your, your camera, camera, camera on your camera. All right. All right. This is not very good camera. All right. All right. Where are we? Where are we? Oh, man. Hold on. Okay. So, I'm showing you my telescope, but our camera is down right now. So, this is my 10 inch. It's a reflector telescope. There's no mirror in the front. There's no lens in the front. There's a mirror in the bottom. Uh, there's a couple of finders up here on top, here and here. Here's the eyepiece. As you can see, it goes up and down, left and right. So it's an alt as. And this does not have tracking, so I have to move it. Uh, so a few other things I want to share with you are Astronomically, binoculars, of course, which are like two refracting telescopes with curved lenses in the front. Oh, that one doesn't work. So here's a little red light that I use. I wear this on my head, uh, and it has a, a red light setting, which we talked about. Um, I want to show you, this is a reflecting mirror. And you can see it concentrates. It's a curved mirror. So this is the kind of mirror you would see in the bottom of a reflecting telescope that concentrates the light up to the eyepiece. The, uh, the eyepiece is what you actually look through. And this is one of the instruments that you would attach to a telescope. This is an eyepiece. And what it does is it takes that the tip of the concentrated light and uh, straightens it out and magnifies it. 
So there's different eyepieces you can put on your telescope. This is a pretty good one, it has a, a, a nice eye relief. Uh, and you can switch out eyepieces on your telescope for greater or lesser magnification. So uh, the other thing I want to see, another thing I show is I use the magazine Sky and Telescope. Uh, and it's not very expensive for a subscription. It has a monthly viewing chart in the center that can be really useful if you're going to go out camping and you want to know what's going to be in the night sky. So I often plan my sessions from the maps in Sky and Telescope. It also has articles. Uh, this one's about uh, radio telescopes. Uh, this one was for August, so I'm getting ready to get started for August. So I'll be planning what I do in August by looking at my Sky and Telescope. Uh, here's my, this is my Astro camera. This is a, 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 a camera that goes on my telescope and it has a digital camera inside it. It's a 20 megapixel and it's designed for capturing light uh, so you can take astronomical photographs. This is something that Spencer has on his telescope. You may have seen it. This is a flip mirror. So you put your camera back here, an eyepiece up here, and you can flip between them and look with your eye or take pictures with your camera. Again, this is going to mount on the back of your telescope. So that's a diagonal flip mirror. That's kind of a useful device. The, uh, obviously, when you take uh, pictures, you're going to use uh, typically a laptop. Uh, so I have a laptop that I use. So the camera attaches to the laptop, the, uh, uh, and then the camera goes on the telescope, and then the images are gathered uh, on your, uh, your telescope. So when you're... Uh, when you're setting up your telescope, you know, you want a flat level uh, spot uh, with a dark sky. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times with modern telescopes, you need to align them to some bright stars and the northern horizon and Polaris. So knowing where north is and where Polaris is, uh, you know, that's one of the things. You know, interestingly, uh, if you can find Polaris tonight, find the Big Dipper, look at the two stars at the end and see if they point towards Polaris. Uh, Polaris, if you think about it, it's the pole star. So if you're standing on the equator of the Earth, it's going to be very close to the horizon. And if you start walking towards the North Pole, it's going to rise higher and higher in the sky until you get to the North Pole when it's going to be directly overhead. So if you think about it, if you measure the angle from the horizon to the North Star, you can determine how far north you are from the equator. And this was the primary way for sailors to navigate and know which latitude they were on in ancient times. You could either eyeball it or you could actually use a, uh, a sextant or an octant or some other optical uh, little protractor like device. You know, measure the angle of Polaris above the horizon and that would tell you where on earth you are located. Um, so I think we, uh, um, oh, I need to see if my presentation is back up. Slideshow. Yes. So alt, tab, zoom. And I want you guys to get the rest of five down, then we'll take our break. So let me get the share screen, slideshow. So we are on five B. So 5B is one that you're going to either have to look up on your own, copy down as much as you can. I'll leave this slide up for a little while. But do we have to copy the whole thing? You, do you see your 5B in your packet? Yeah. Okay, so you got to fill that grid out. What's exactly what you put? Like. Yes, what I put is the correct answer, if that's the question you're asking. Does that make sense, James? Yeah, okay. it just mine doesn't have the year part, so. Well, if you think about it, I started in June of 2020 and went to June of 2021. So you, your first month would be June, because that, well, that, actually that's, my, I guess your first month would be July. Okay. And you can see right now, the planets that are most visible and the early evening are Jupiter and Saturn, right, in July of 2020. And you may, you'll, you'll very likely be able to see those tonight when we take our break. Uh, 
So yeah, 5B requires you to list what planets are visible in what month for the next year. And you got to fill this thing out, right? You either get it out of your merit badge book or use an online uh, sky chart or use my presentation. Uh, the next, uh, Mars is going to be the next planet visible. Actually, if you stay up till past midnight, Mars is already rising right now. Uh, so remember, what's visible in the night sky depends on what time of day it is. So I put this for 8 p.m., which we're already past. And so right now in July of 2020, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are the only visible planets. So on your little worksheet, you would write Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn across the top. Uh, you would write down the month, uh, and then you would check off, you know, where planets are visible in the grid. And this is just a chart to help you understand that planets come and go depending on their motion. So I will leave this uh, chart up, and you know, if you are confused by this chart, you can email me. Uh, but this is just showing you at 8 p.m. in the early evening for each of the next 12 months what planets are visible in the night sky. And remember, for each of these months, the Earth is changing its position around the sun. So that's why different planets are visible at different times. So uh, the planets slowly drift across the star field uh, from night to night, week to week, month to month. Uh, when the Earth passes you know, um, the orbit of another planet, the motion changes to retrograde, retrograde, it makes a little loop and then goes back the other way. So generally speaking, the, the planets, why they're called planets is, you know, stars never move, right? Not in our lifetimes. They, they move so little, they're barely measurable. So we call the stars the fixed stars, right? Now, the sky rotates around, but the stars don't change positions relative to each other, right? But the planets as we discussed earlier, they move from constellation to constellation through the zodiac. I'm so confused. And that's because the, the planets are orbiting the sun, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, as Mars comes around, it changes its position, and then the Earth is changing its position as well. Uh, so if we're, you know, on the opposite, you know, if we're on the opposite side of the sun from Mars, Mars is up there, but it's up near the sun and it's up during the day. So uh, what we mean by visible is visible in the early evening and in this case for Los Angeles. So the motion of the planets in 5C uh, is, you know, they move slowly through the constellations depending on which planet and the orbit. Uh, D is, I, I hope you're going to see Jupiter tonight so you can write down what you saw. Again, you're going to be looking for a very bright, disk, a uh, smallish disk in the southeastern horizon just rising between 8.30 and 9. Uh, and uh, if, you can, if, you can, uh, if you can spot Saturn, that will do for 5. Uh, if you can spot Jupiter, that will do for 5D. If you wait until later tonight and it's darker, uh, both Jupiter and Saturn will be visible. So as you can see, uh, for July 2020 in your 5B chart, uh, Saturn and Jupiter are the only planets you're going to see tonight, uh, unless you stay up late and then Mars is rising later. But you can see Mars is going to be visible in the early evening starting in October. I actually think there's a, it's coming close to the Earth uh, in September, October in that range. So uh, Mars is going to be a great target uh, uh, in a few months. Uh, so I'm going to continue to leave this slide up for a little bit. That's 5B, the motion of planets, 5C. Uh, and then hopefully 5D, you'll see Jupiter tonight when we take our break. So that's, uh, that's the end of number five. I'll leave this slide up during the break in case more of you want to copy it down. If you get confused and have a question, email me or I can send you a copy of the presentation or you can watch the YouTube video, right? So uh, it's 8.36 and getting pretty dark. Um, I think we'll take our break. Um, we'll try to resume at, so we say nine o'clock. Okay. Okay. So guys, this is a break to use the restroom, get a drink, but you're also tasked with getting your sky chart, going outside and having some goal, find Polaris or see Jupiter or, or whatever. When you come back, 
feel free in the chat to type in what you saw and we'll uh, we'll call out uh, you know what people are, are able to spot tonight. Do be careful, it's getting a little dark out, so be safe. We'll see you in about 20 minutes. Miss Thank Mr. you. Thompson?